Today we're going to look at jet boat power, thrust, and nozzle size. So in the jet boat world I often hear people say things like, this pump won't lift the load or this other pump will lift the load. So this raises the question, well what are they actually talking about? And it turns out they're talking about thrust, which is related to nozzle size. Many jet boaters may have sort of an intuitive feel for this, or we can look at it from the perspective of math and physics, because it is actually based in reality. So we're going to start with a basic algebra review for those of you who forgot all your algebra or never really learned it in the first place. The first equation is just saying that when you see m and v side by side, this is the same as multiplication. And equation 2 is just saying that v is the same as v to the first power. Equation 3 is saying v times v equals v to the first power times v to the first power, which is v squared. And you'll notice the, the 2 exponent in the square is the same as 1 plus 1. So that, that's how you uh, figure out what the final exponent is. Just add all the, uh, the small numbers and then you end up with a 2. Equation 4 is just a specific example where 2 times 2 times 2 equals 2 to the third. You notice you get the 3 is the same as 1 plus 1 plus 1, and 2 to the third is the same as 8. And equation 5 is another specific example where we have 8 to the 1 third times 8 to the 1 third times 8 to the 1 third equals 8 to the 1. And you'll notice 1 is the same as 1 third plus 1 third plus 1 third. And then 8 to the 1 is, of course, 8. Equation 6 is a bit more interesting where we have 8 to the 2 thirds. This is equal to 8 to the 1 third times 8 to the 1 third. And if you compare equations 4 and 5, you'll notice that 8 to the 1 third is the same as 2. So 8 to the 2 thirds equals 2 times 2, which equals 4. Equation 7 is really simple, which is 2 equals 2. And you'll notice if you divide one side of the equation by the other side, you end up with 2 over 2, which equals 1. And this is an important lead-in to equation 8, which is 12 inches equals 1 foot. You know this. And if you divide 12 inches by 1 foot, then you get 1. So that's just a common thread. It looks kind of funny when you see 12 over 1 equals 1, but as long as you keep the inches in the numerator and the feet in the de denominator, then you're good. Just, just don't accidentally delete those. Next, we're going to have a fluid flow lesson. And you'll see that first equation is m dot equals dVA. And m dot is just a common uh, uh, nomenclature for mass flow rate. So it would be like pounds per second. And d is the density of the fluid, v is the velocity, and a is, is the flow area. So for example, the, uh, the flow rate down, down a pipe is d times v times a, density times velocity times area. You can visualize this using the, this little diagram uh, where the arrow is velocity, which is feet per second, and then the red oval is the area that the velocity is passing through, and the area is in feet squared. So VA is feet per second times feet squared, which is feet cubed per second, which is a more familiar term, cubic feet per second. Then density equals pounds per cubic foot, and dVA then becomes pounds per cubic foot times feet cubed per second, which is simply pounds per second, which is the flow rate. And as a practical uh, frame of reference, water density is about 62 pounds per cubic foot. And if you remember, there's about 8 pounds per gallon. So, you know, in, in rough numbers, you've got about 8 gallons per cubic foot. And now we're going to have a physics lesson. You know, if you never took physics, uh, this may be a bit over your head, uh, you know, but maybe you can follow along anyway. You know, if, if, it, uh, if it doesn't interest you, then you can always skip to the end to the practical examples. So the first equation is E equals 1 half mv squared, where E is energy and m is mass and v is velocity again. Then power is in equation 2, so P is power which is 1 half m dot v squared. And you'll notice it's very similar to the equation above. Uh, instead of having just m, we have the flow rate of mass. So that gives you the power. Then recall from our fluid flow lesson that m dot equals dVA. And we substitute that in and then end up with uh, power equals 1 half dAv cubed. So what we'll be looking at here is the idea that we have a constant power and then we'll be looking at how the area and the velocity have to change to maintain that constant power. In the final form of equation 2, we have constant power, then 1 half, that's a constant, 
and the density is also about constant. So we can just combine those into a single constant and this gives us equation 3 which is C1, which is constant, equals area times velocity cubed. So what equation 3 is telling us is if the velocity is multiplied by a factor of 2, then we take 2 cubed, that's 8, and then in order to have the equation still hold, then the, the area has to decrease by a factor of 8. So assuming your engine is putting out a constant power, then if the uh, pump nozzle area goes up, the velocity has to go down. And if the area goes down, then the velocity goes up. The equation 4 is a bit more difficult and probably beyond the scope of the simple algebra lesson that this video started with. Uh, but basically I take the C1 on the left side of equation 3, divide by A, then take the cube root and that gives me the, uh, the second term in equation 4. And, and then I rearrange it again uh, to a slightly different form. Uh, there's another thing in there that uh, I, I didn't discuss before, but if you have a to the one-third and that a is in the de denominator, if you want to move that into the numerator, then you can just t change the a to the one-third to a to the minus a third, and, and that gets you there. And I'm not going to explain that. Uh, you know, Maybe you can look that up and figure it out for yourself. So now we'll move on to the momentum equation, which is equation 5. And O we're using to symbolize momentum. And momentum equals mv, which is mass times velocity. And you'll notice the uh, equation 5 is very similar to equation 1, which is E equals 1 half mv squared. You notice the energy equation just has an extra 1 half and an extra v. So they are very similar form. And now we'll move on to equation 6 for thrust, which is the flow of momentum, or m dot v. And you'll notice that equation 6 is very similar to equation 5 above it. It's just got the m dot instead of the m. And m dot is the flow of mass, and we know from previously that that is dVa. So that gives us the, the right-hand term in equation 6. 6a then consolidates uh, equation 6, and in 6b we substitute equation 4 into equation 6a and 6c then we rearrange and simplify a little bit and finally get to 6d which is the most simplified form. So recall our basic assumption in this is that we're working with constant power and given that assumption then equation 6d is basically saying that uh, as a increases then thrust will also increase. So if a goes up by a factor of 8 then the thrust will increase by a factor of 2. Next we'll take what we've already learned and convert these functions from functions of area into functions of diameter. Equation 1 is just the formula for the area of a circle uh, based on the diameter, so it's 1 fourth pi d squared. So that's just a common equation. So we can take that and substitute it into our equation for c1, and then we have c1 equals 1 quarter pi d squared v cubed. And you'll notice c1 is constant, and the quarter is constant, and so is the pi. So we can just lump those all into one constant, and then rearrange the equation into the final form, which is velocity equals c3 over d to the two-thirds power. And c3 is, again, just a constant. It doesn't really matter what that is, because we're just after a, a relative things. Uh, you'll see that in a minute. Then we substitute the equation for area into thrust, and we end up with this relatively long and complicated thing for thrust. But then we note that the d is relatively constant, c1 is constant, and the quarter and the pi are also constant, so we can lump those all into a new constant and re rewrite the equation in a relatively simple form, which is the final t equals c2 d to the two-thirds power. So again, these equations tell us that if the diameter goes up, then the velocity goes down. And if the diameter goes up, then the thrust goes up. So that means a relatively large diameter pump like the Hamilton 212 or even bigger diameter 241 uh, will tend to have a lot of thrust, where something like a Berkeley will have relatively low thrust. But on the flip side, the Berkeley velocity will be higher. And as we saw in a previous video, the higher the speed of the water coming out the back of your pump, the higher the speed of your boat can be. So with a Berkeley, you'll speed up a bit slower, but your top speed can be higher. So here's some real-world examples where I'm using the proportionality of the equations 
to get relative thrust numbers for various pump setups. So the first example is for my Hamilton 212 pump with it both bored out slightly and with a nozzle insert. And with it slightly bored out, the diameter is 112 millimeters, and with the insert, it's uh, 102 millimeters. So you take that ratio to the two-thirds power, and you see 1.06. So with it bored out, it has 6% more thrust than with the insert. And the second example compares my Hamilton bored slightly over with a Berkeley. And so the Hamilton diameter is about 112 millimeters, and the Berkeley is around 80. I, I didn't get that exact, but you know it's, it's pretty close to that. So you take that ratio to the two-thirds power, and you end up with 1.25. So that means for a particular power, the Hamilton will have 25% more thrust than the Berkeley. So these ratios are correct only at low speed. As you speed up, then they will decrease, and eventually, if you get going fast enough, they'll actually uh, fall below one, implying that the Berkeley will have more thrust than the Hamilton, and the inserted Hamilton will have more thrust than the board over Hamilton. This is why people prefer the Berkeley over the Hamilton for high-speed applications, because you have more thrust at high speed and you can go faster. But if your objective is to carry a heavy load, not necessarily at the highest speed, then the Hamilton will clearly win. And that, that's my experience with both the Berkeley and the Hamilton. Uh, the Hamilton does do better. But once you're up to speed, then you really won't notice the difference. So you may ask the question, well, are these equations 100% correct? And the answer is no, they're not. But they are close enough that you can get a pretty good idea of what the effect of changing one pump for another or putting a, a nozzle insert will be. So from a philosophical perspective, I've been working with this kind of stuff quite a bit since the mid-70s, so a lot of this is really obvious to me. Uh, but there's a lot of things that aren't obvious to me, too. You know, like, for example, I'm not particularly good at rebuilding engines. Uh, so one of the things that I like to do as I go through life is be aware of what's obvious to me and what might not be obvious to others, and then try to uh, spread my knowledge around. I really don't think there's anything wrong with that. In fact, I think that's good. You know, a lot of people like to keep their secrets, you know, so that only they know this one thing, you know, and other people don't. But I, I just don't think that's a good policy, and, and I like to help everybody be more aware. So now, again, you know what I know. <laughs>